Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome, viewers, to thinktechhawaii.com. This show is the will of the people, and I am your host, Martha E. Randolph. Today, I am so proud to welcome Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa for this episode, which I am calling Being in Congress, You Can't Always Get What You Want. How does business get done in the House of Representatives? And for my guest, we can compare her past experiences to current events. Uh, I expect that the reality may prove very different from voter assumptions. In addition to having a doctorate in law, Colleen was the first female president of the Hawaii State Senate and the first woman to chair the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transit. And in her third year of her current term as a congresswoman, she is a member of the House leadership team and is on several important committees, the House Committee and Steering Committees, the House Armed Services and Natural Resources Committee, where she is the ranking member for federal lands, and the Science and Space Technology Committee. What an introduction. Welcome, Colleen, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Martha. It has been, it's a wonderful, wonderful blessing to me that you agreed to come, because this woman knows things, and we're going to ask her what she knows, because we will never find out any other way. Um, to begin with, I would like to ask you if you have any set plans. Now that you have, you came back to Hawaii, you competed for uh, the governorship's um, nomination. I think that you lost in part because of the very poor turnout for Democratic primaries, which in this state you'd think they'd know <laughs> that the primary is almost the election. So uh, what are you going to do now? And does it have anything to do with running for office in the future or for just right now, if that's all you want to talk about. Well, I'll tell you, um, right now I'm still in the Congress, and will be till I think it's January 3rd of okay. next year. And so technically, depending on what happens next Tuesday, it's going to determine how busy or how not busy we're going to be. Okay. Because if it's, of course, if it switches, which of course many of us hope that the House will switch, mm. then I would estimate that the Republican majority will try to do as much as they can as the majority while they control everything. Right. Uh, for my future, I really don't know yet, Martha. It's something that people always ask, as you can imagine. And uh, the one thing that I have to admit that makes me feel gratified is the mm -hmm. fact that there are so many people who come up to me and say, well, the one thing we don't want to hear is to say that, that you say that you're not going to run again. Mm. And I keep telling people, you know, I've had an amazing run. I really have. Yeah. For a political career compared to others, I have not had a long political career by Hawaii standards. Mm. As you know, people like Calvin Say has been office for 42 years. Uh, yeah. You yeah. know, so, you know, I'm, I basically have held office for 18. So I'm a relative newcomer to mm. all of them. But in that time, like you said, I've been able to be the first woman Senate president, the first woman to hit chair either house, the first mm. Asian woman in the nation, plus run for Congress and have that for six years now. And I said, you know, for people, it's an amazing political journey, because mm -hmm. what it has given me is a taste of everything. So in a way, I feel like I've been very blessed, for lack of a better way of explaining yeah. it, and that, you know, maybe it's time to have others have the same experience. And yet there are others who tell me, oh, no, 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 you can't let all of that go to waste because we've invested in you. Mm. So. A long answer to a very to a short, straightforward question. Which is, is, you don't know. I don't know yet. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> that, that works. Now, um, as we were discussing before, I did my research, good girl me, and discovered that your first experience in the House began in 2011, which mm -hmm. for those of you who may or may not know, was when the Republicans took control of the House during the Obama administration, and they have not let it go since. And the nature of Republicans today is not Republicans as they used to be, although there are certain issues they've always mm -hmm. uh, had and contested with the Democrats. But this is a very reactionary group of Republicans. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm using the term reactionary in the conventional, traditional sense, which is people who want to roll back the clock on progress. Uh, we can call them right-wing extremists, if you wish, but I don't know if that's true of all the politicians. I know their support base tends to be that way in many cases. You have been in office having to be 
on the receiving end mm -hmm. of this dominating way of thinking. And I wonder if you can tell people how that has made you feel and if it had anything to do with your ultimate decision recently to return to Hawaii and try to run for local office. Your answer is always, I would do better for the people if I'm home. Let's tell them why. Well, you know, it's true. And, and, and as we said earlier, the first 12 years of my political career was in the Hawaii State Senate. And when you're Senate president, and, you know, I was a combination of judiciary chair and majority leader, vice president, vice chair of Ways and Means, in addition to being Senate president. So I had a lot in terms of uh, leadership positions in that short period of time. So you know what, what it can be like to yeah. be able to affect change and to be able to affect legislation. You're right. Not only is it the numbers, there's only 25 in the Senate, but you still have to convince the House, 51 yeah. in Hawaii. But on the mainland, in the Congress, it's 435 of us in the House of Representatives, 100 in the Senate. Plus, you know, right now we don't have a, a sympathetic president. No. But having said that, what if you want to do something, well, I believe that for mm. someone like me who wants to do something and feels that, that there'll be a stall in Washington because of the, as long as they control the presidency, I'm talking about Republicans control mm. the presidency, and they control at least one of the houses, you're not going to see anything done. I felt that Hawaii was at a major crossroads, mm. that we have been very fortunate. But so much of our economic base and the well-being of the people are coming sort of at a major crossroads now. And unless we have great leadership here who can see where we need to go, we're just going to wake up one day and say, what happened to the Hawaii that we all care about? Mm. So that is the reason why I said it's time to come home and I can do more, because it's not going to be simple to do things in Washington, D.C., when you're the chief executive officer mm. of the state, you're the chair or you're, you're the head of one branch of the three branches of right. government, and there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to affect change because everything here is relational and everyone knows each other. Mm. Well, you know, like, for example, I know the chief justice of the Supreme Court. Many of the justices were were quote unquote confirmed while I was there. Yeah. And also, you know, the legislature. They're all right. my friends. A lot of them are my friends. I shouldn't say all. A lot of them are my friends. So if you can't go and do things in that scenario, mm. then something is absolutely wrong. May so, I just ask, when you were sure. talking about the Supreme Court, were you talking about the federal Supreme Court? No, I was Court? talking about the Hawaii Supreme Court. All right, because you were also Hawaii. there for the confirmation of a number of federal Supreme Court judges. Yes, which but we didn't have a say. I didn't yeah. think they were your friends. That's no, okay. No, no, no. All right. No, no. I'm talking about the Hawaii <laughs> Supreme Court. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. All right. Yeah, so, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an opportunity here, I believe, to be able to do the change and to be able to actually affect what we would like to see happen for Hawaii's future. Mm. That's why I said I can do more, and it's always a matter of serving Hawaii and coming back. Now, I have to be honest with you. I mean, it's not like being in Washington, we did absolutely nothing. That's, yeah. that's not true. And I have had the, um, I guess, the opportunity to actually work across the aisles and yeah. get things done. Uh, but it's not like what you can do here. No, no, of course not. I was going to say, I'm sure that the most important reason to have people like you in Washington would be if your ability to go across the aisle and to speak to your colleagues and remind them that their responsibility is to the nation, not just to the party, and work on your personal relationship with them. You can sometimes get mm -hmm. some support, but I have noticed in the era of Donald Trump that even the Republicans who will speak out against his position will still vote to support it. And I find that very questionable. If you have any insights into that as to why the Republican Party and the Republican leadership, which in many cases does not agree with what Donald Trump has done or has said, continue to push through agendas which obviously are not really supported by the majority of the people and which go against the things that they say they support. I would love to know what what do the leadership have on these people besides we're controlling the bucks to getting you reelected? And is that why there are 70 Republicans who've insisted that they will not run again? Well, you know, I was going to point out that 
that it's not true of all Republicans. True. And and a lot of them who are not running again is actually a function of this guy called Newt Gingrich. When Newt Gingrich put in a maximum term mm. of how long one could be a chair. So many of them who have decided that they will retire, it's not only whether or not they have to worry more about the, quote, the Freedom Caucus or the Tea Party when I first got elected. It's also about where do we move in terms of our status. So a lot of the, unfortunately, the moderate Republicans, those who I would be able to reach across the aisle for, have decided it's time to go. So many of them we have been able to, quote, cut the deal with. Right. And because they are moderates. But they have also said no. So it's someone asked me this question when I first got elected. Okay. He said, what would you go back home to Hawaii and tell your constituents that would absolutely surprise them? And my response was that, you know, we have two groups, the extreme left, we have left too, and the yes, extreme absolutely. right, and the extreme right was called Tea Party then. And the amazing thing is that they come together and they vote no, for absolutely different reasons. But, but they, they vote no. Yes. So it yeah. leaves it up to the middle, or those who may not be as progressive or as to the right, to come together and get things done. Right. Yes. And that's and that's a really odd position to be in because they will come to you and they'll say, you know, you're pretty safe in your seat. So can you support us on this? Mm -hmm. Whereas those who have, depending on which side they're on, a more difficult election, they're given the the pass, and you can go home and say, I voted this way because of this, and you know, and I'm not compromising my my principles, but to keep government, for example, from shutting down, the rest are asked, okay, can you right. vote for this? Hold your nose, but vote for this. Mm. And, and that's what it's still all about. Right. It's still about how solid are you in your district, and can we call upon you to support this position, even if everything in it is not what you want? Okay, all right. So there seems to always be a degree of personal individual interest, self-interest, mm -hmm. involved in the whole thing almost from the beginning, from the very first day of office. Uh, and while certainly the, the power of people would be to, we will reelect you or we will not reelect you, it seems to be interfering with the process of government, uh, almost as much as the Supreme Court decision that had corporations declared to have equal rights with people when it came to making contributions. If money is going to determine mm -hmm. uh, what your candidate will say, do you remember back in the day when you gave money to the candidate who represented what you want instead of giving money to the candidate who will do what you want? I'm not sure. A lot of people say that time never existed, when people actually gave can monies to candidates. And that's why there's such a movement now to have just publicly funded elections. Yeah. Except when people find out how much a publicly funded election will we'll cost, cost, and it will cost taxpayers dollars. And then, of course, no one thinks that's a wise no. use of our monies. But no, you, you are right. And I think for, for contributions that are you know, so small uh, mm -hmm. or, or not large, but you know, it, people who run for office, especially federal office or statewide office, mm. they're always looking for as much of the maximum contributions as of they course. can get. Of course. And of course, with that comes the assumption, especially with Citizens United, that it, 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 it's got to be with strings attached, because why would anybody give you that money? That's right. Exactly. Why would they give you that money? Exactly. And I don't know any politician that will have the guts to stand up and say, I'll take your money, but I'll do what I think is right, because it don't work that way. We're going to take a short break sure. now, Colleen. Uh, boy, I could talk to this woman for the next two hours, but fortunately, she's not obligated to do that. And we will be back in just a few minutes to the will of the people on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana 
all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Welcome back to The Will of the People on thinktechhawaii.com. I am your host, Martha Randolph, and my guest today is Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa, who's going to have a very busy several weeks to come because she is still our Congresswoman. And let's appreciate the fact that she's here. Thank you, Colleen, for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, I would like to ask you if you think the Democratic National Committee or the Democratic Party in general has understood or learned anything from the past 15 years or so of, of electioneering, and if they are really recognizing that it's not just that the Republican side won, it's that they have lost, which tells me that they have not been doing their job correctly. Have we heard, yes, great, National Committee has two leaders and they're representing both sides because the most recent debacle between Bernie Sanders and uh, Hillary Clinton really raised everyone's ire and really caused this situation. As we approach very important elections in the next few days and even maybe more important in two years, has the party seen what's going on? Have they made some wise choices or are they looking for leadership that wouldn't really take back the Congress and the presidency? You know, I think that's a question that uh, applies across the board. Mm. You know, uh, in 2008, uh, Senator Noah and I did uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign here. And of course, we, the way we explained it, and people in Hawaii understands this, is we said that's the most low, low thing to do because Barack Obama was one of ours. Yes. So, you know, to, but we both believed that, that Hillary had then probably the most qualifications to Absolutely. To I do voted it. for her, yeah. And in, in 20, um, and then, and basically in, in 2016, I was uh, fortunate enough to be the delegate to the platform committee for the Democratic National Committee mm. in um, Orlando, Florida. And that was really, Hillary had already secured the nomination. I will tell you, it was very interesting because in 2008, the, the Hillary people, the position was Barack Obama is the nominee. Therefore, the platform should be Barack Obama's platform. And there was really no attempt to affect that platform other than, you know, to basically support the mm. president because he needed that, that, uh, that support. In 2016, there was a completely different view. And I think what it shows you, it isn't negative or positive. What, what I'm saying, it was a different perspective. The, those who supported Bernie Sanders felt so strongly in, the, in what he stood for that they would not, they would not simply say, you know, we're just going to step back and let this mm. be a Clinton platform. It was, we are Democrats, and this is what we believe we stand for. Mm. I think what that showed you already is that there was a difference in the party. So Absolutely. there, there, is, there was a divide, in a way. Yes. And, uh, and it was almost, in my opinion, to a certain extent, irreconcilable. Right. Because, okay. because they were so far apart on certain issues. And even when we were able to strike an agreement in Orlando, there were many of the Bernie supporters who refused to, to simply buy into it. Mm. which I, f I thought was a, a very strong statement, mm. and that maybe the party was beginning to change, and can the party change? I think, unfortunately, what we're finding is that the party cannot change as easily as people think. And it's not something that we can, you know, like we all say, we must make room for the millennials. The millennials are the next generation. But how do you reach the millennials. Mm. How do you tell them that democratic principles are really what you should covet and you should mm. s uh, seek? 
And that's not something that people can do easily because, like you said earlier, we are all coming at this from a certain perspective. Mm. And that perspective is not something that has been open to, to how they feel. And they sense it. So mm. the, the, the generations that follow us and also those who are not supportive of the same candidates that mm. we may have supported, they don't believe that we're sincere and that we really mean to reach out and say, yes, you, you're part of us. They don't think we think that way. How much would you say the shocking incidents of uh, the invasion of the Democratic Party's um, computers and the revelation of the emails uh, might have played in this? And I only mention this because while I was less than surprised mm -hmm. that something like that had happened, because it seemed to me it was going to happen sooner or later, what bothered me is I don't recall any Democrat getting on screen and saying, those emails never should have been there to be found in the first place. It was inappropriate to try and orchestrate a nomination where the two very important people with things to say, who were very respectable, were going to compete. So be it. But you don't put them down. You don't support one or the other. And you certainly don't put it in any situation where it can be heard or read about. It was like a thief who apologizes for getting caught instead of yeah. for having committed the theft. And I think, from the, the supporters of Bernie Sanders that I spoke to, that that created this whole line of mistrust of the establishment Democratic Party. In, because, frankly, they're not very politically wise, our little Sa Bernie Sanderites. I love them, but they're not that wise. And they don't, they haven't watched the process since the time of Kennedy being manipulated on the floor. These things have been going on. This is not new. But I think they were shocked and surprised. And so I bring up the question. You know, it, I was concerned um, in the, the, after the 2016 election. This is what I was concerned about. I was concerned if Bernie Sanders would run for re-election as a Democrat or as an independent. And the reason why is because I think what was lost in this whole process and was not emphasized, and I would, as a Democrat, I would have liked to see it emphasized, is mm. the fact that the Democratic Party is really a party, like we always say, has a big tent. Mm. Because what it did do was, uh, for an independent, and we know how how almost impossible it is, unless you're a billionaire like Ross Perot, mm. to launch a presidential campaign is, 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 an, is something you can't do unless you have all these billions behind you. Right. So I think what I thought was missing in that whole discussion was the fact that the Democratic Party set things aside, like whether technically mm -hmm. he could run because he wasn't a card-carrying Democrat, Democrat as a Democrat and then tap into the system or, or, or not. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought the fact that the party said, okay, you know, we're going to try and build them. And I'm sure it was self-serving, whoever yeah. made the decision, that it was to build a bigger base and right. they were hoping to tap into it. But having said that and having done that, you're right about... Um, Debbie, Debbie's emails and so forth that that what should not have been found and should not have all these things should and they, not have they been They should written. not have been done in they the first place. Been, right. If you want to talk about that in the corner, fine, but don't communicate over main channels. But I, I think the problem is that because there's no expectation that it will be, mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure we all can agree that people have said these things orally to each other, and, mm -hmm. and whether on both sides probably have done it. Yeah. But. The fact that it was it was available and written and then it was made public is is the, what undermined I think the whole integrity of the system. I agree with you. Yeah. It should not have been done. Yeah. But I also believe that that's something that was being said anyway. This is true. And 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 uh, you know it's it's something that you can't you can't undo. No. But the problem still remains though. Do we have it in us to come together as a party in and the And has end? the party learned from that? Because Bernie, obviously, as you just pointed out, represented certain ideals, which, to be honest, since George Bush Jr., since the 9-11, I have watched Democrats backtrack and backtrack against principles that they used to stand mm -hmm. up for. There is a point where negotiation becomes giving up. And I understood. 
I did not agree with all of Bernie's theories for the simple reason that I didn't think it was going to be doable. But um, I understood his passion, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm concerned about, whether the party has recognized that this passion for people who will speak out, who will stand up, and who will not compromise certain essential values is there. But I only have a few minutes, and I do would, would like you to please tell the people how that money is distributed when it comes to elections. We have seen some interesting campaigns recently where uh, Democrats, some have been supported, some have not. Some of them, whom you would have thought should have been supported, lost by 2 percent, where one who was actively supported lost by 30 percent. It seems to me the decision-making is a little skewed. Can you tell us a little bit about how that big election money is spent? and? Where it comes from. Where it comes from, but also, more importantly, does the party realize it may have to start supporting more newcomers and fewer of the old guard if they're going to take back the country? Well, the other thing that we have to realize is where the money comes from and who mm. raises that money. So I can tell you about the DCCC, which is what the, the organization is, the Campaign Committee for the House, the Congressional House. So what happens there, and a lot of people don't know this, is that once you get elected, you're assessed a dues, and it's huge. Like, like for example, Nancy Pelosi, I think single-handedly can raise almost a hundred million dollars, but I think her dues are officially around twenty-five million or something along those lines. One person, that's her dues. She has to pay that to the party. To the part, to the to the D triple C, not the DNC. The D triple. So the Senate and the House have their own basically their committees yeah. that then selects the candidates and determines who will be the person endorsed. Mm. I can tell you, when I ran in 2010 for 2011, I was not the choice. I know this. I was I not the this. choice. Mm. And so the party decided on their own, including those in power till today, that I was not the choice. And they didn't think that I could win in 20, 2010. So they did not support me. So what happens is that all this money goes in. If you are able to prevail, like you are for the, 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 the general election, then the assessment will be made, can you win? And then people within the Congress will start to write checks to you. Mm -hmm. And some of them who are interested in you as a candidate will get their support base to do it. What has happened since then to now mm. that people do not pay enough attention to is the use of the Internet. Wow. Yes, of course. And social Which media. That, a, that raises Bernie taught us, right. Obama taught us. Right. That's a big And thing. that is another issue. Right. As I said, ladies and gentlemen, we do have to go now. I want to thank Colleen Hanabusa. As I said, we could do this for the next two hours. And I will probably beg her on my knees and grovel pathetically in the hopes that she will return to the show someday and we will pick up here because, ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand what's happening. Yes, get out and vote, but also find your information. I want to thank you all for watching the show. I want to encourage you to come back again, and we'll see you in two weeks. This has been Martha Randolph and Colleen Hanabusa on The Will of the People.